Hello, Googleization Nation, and welcome to Beyond the Office, Building and Leading Remote Teams, a GGG Unleashed podcast with thought leader Bill Keller. I'm Ira Wolf. And I'm Jason Cochran. In each of Bill's episodes, you'll get the latest research, trends, and tips on remote work to build and lead cohesive teams around the world for the future of work. Let's begin. Well, welcome back to Beyond the Office, building and leading remote teams. I'm glad to have you back. And on this episode, we're going to be going over two books. And uh, one of them, I believe, gives us a map to the future. One of them is kind of an obscure manufacturing book from 30 years ago that also then allows us to use that map for the future to see how we can optimize the things that are coming in the future and be able to use it for our benefit. So what are the books we're talking about today? Like I said in the beginning, before we started this series, I'm an avid reader, so I I love this stuff. And uh, the first one is The End of the World is Just the Beginning by Peter Zeehan. And the second one is The Goal. Uh, Some of you who've been in manufacturing might know this one, and it is also an excellent book and by Eli Goldratt. Um, And so we're going to be talking about those two. So let's start with The End of the World is Just the Beginning by Peter Zeehan. So why is this an important book? And because we're kind of living right now in a very unique age, he tells us. After the end of World War II, the Americans went to basically the the people who were left after the war. And rather than kind of taking over all these countries and trying to rule them all ourselves, we kind of made a deal with them. And this is what we did. We said is we're going to patrol the global oceans so you can trade with anybody you want to. And we think that this, we know this is globalization, global trade. This is what we've grown up with. This is all we've ever Ever known and we so we think this is all there has ever been but that really has not been the case um, because you know you needed to protect your trade oftentimes militarily before and you know moving into this new world where you could trade with anybody was very new in fact you know because if you didn't have all the elements that you needed to to build a society if you didn't have the coal the iron ore the food the fuel right you were probably a colony that somebody was colonizing and taking your resources to then get those things and so now we moved into a different world order where you didn't need to have everything you could have just one or of those elements and you could trade for the rest and in doing so the reason that we did this was so that we could control their security to policy, security policy as we tried to basically protect against Russia. And so with the end of the Cold War, almost 30 years ago now, our ability and also our need to basically hold this whole coalition together is waning. And we're starting to see how this world order is breaking down. And so if you're, you might be sitting here looking and saying, what are you talking about? You know, all this trade is, you know, still going on. I don't see any of this, but if you really look between below the surface, we're starting to see a lot more tensions between the U S and China. You're seeing how this global trade can very easily break down where Iran, is uh, taking over oil tankers basically with with impunity and there's really no consequences to that and so if those types of things start to continue it will make global trade much harder and so what peter is saying in his book is is that's going to take us back to a world before world war ii and so what does that mean to you and why is this important you know is this just a an economics book that really has no bearing in everyday life but what we're going to start to see is when we start to see this world trade break down where we've been getting a lot of manufacturing from China, we're going to start to see a lot of that coming back to the US. And so that's where the rubber meets the road for our audience here. As the manufacturing starts to get onshored back into the US, what's that going to mean? Because it's going to start to put pressure. We're already seeing incredible job pressures. The baby boomers are leaving, right? Some smaller generations are coming up. We don't have as many workers as we used to. And so that's going to put even more pressure on the job market and what can you do to respond to that right because if you're you're feeling the pinch right that's where the second book the goal comes in so as peter's saying is we're going to have a great opportunity for incredible growth here in the u.s which is really that's the success story you know many people they often look at china but he's seeing over the next 30 years china's population is going to drop almost in half and 
that creates many problems. Even though they have over a billion people, dropping over in half um, is going to create incredible problems for them. And many people that basically they're going to get old before they get rich. And so many people kind of see China the way when I was growing up and in high school that Japan was going to take over the world. And many people like Ray Dalio see that uh, China is going to take over the world. But Peter has a, a different view of things. And obviously there, there's different views and you need to create your own map for what's going to be happening happening moving forward and into the future. But I think Peter lays out an incredible roadmap and it, he does a very good job. And I think he has a, a lot of support behind his ideas. And so if you, you take his view, you know, what's that going to mean as we start to bring manufacturing trade relations start to break apart? If you're in the manufacturing world, what does that mean for you? Are you able to onshore? You know, even though this isn't really part of building and leading remote teams, it's helping you to understand where the world's headed and where you might have to to move and so really encourage you to to read the book understand what that's going to mean as we start to put more pressure on the job market more people coming back into manufacturing and even if you're not in manufacturing that could still put more pressure on getting people in because they're being taken into manufacturing or when you're building new manufacturing plants that requires a host of other types of support services that are also going to then affect your ability to get the labor you need even if you're in the service industry and so then that brings us to to the goal. Um, this is a very unique book. It was a manufacturing book that uh, he had developed a theory of constraints, basically to help you to run a manufacturing company. And he was having a hard time selling his computerized software. So he decided that he was going to write a book to illustrate how you could use his software. But the thing that was kind of unique about this book, it was written in a novel format. So you can follow Alex Rogo as he goes through and he takes over this manufacturing plant that has an endless array of problems that he has to fix. And so he starts to learn some of these solutions, what he calls the theory of constraints basically is. So if you can imagine you have a water bottle in you and you were to flip that water bottle upside down, right? What's going to determine the rate of flow of water out of the bottom of the bottle? It's going to be the bottleneck, right? So how big that bottleneck will determine the rate of flow of the water out. So that's what he's saying that we can use to control our companies. We look for those bottlenecks, right? Every company has a bottleneck. Sometimes the bottleneck is inside the company, means it could be in production, it could be in sales, but maybe it's external. Maybe there's uh, not enough uh, supply of materials like we just had. A good example would be when there was a chip shortage, the bottleneck might be external to your factory. So understanding what the bottlenecks are in your organization are super important. And that's gonna, I'm gonna move back to building and, and leading remote teams in this section here. What he talks about is, is looking at local optimums, right? We're, we're looking, we take a bottle, right? And instead of widening the bottleneck, we widen the top part of the bottle, right? And we say, oh, look at us. Our operation within the company is going 50% faster, but no more product is flowing out the bottom of the bottle or no more throughput through the company, right? And in fact, we might even be getting less because what happens is somebody within the company says, oh, I'm making my job faster. But by doing that, maybe it makes it more difficult for one of the downstream processes to happen. So how does global remote staffing fit into this? Even in a manufacturing environment, let me give you some examples. So right now we have a manufacturer who runs a laser. And in that laser process, rather than having the operator spend operation time building the parts to, for the machine to run or loading them onto the machine, we actually have people from 10,000 miles away in India to create the files and then load them onto the machine so the machine operator can stay busy basically producing the parts. And so that's one of the ways that global remote staffing can actually help in your manufacturing because in this particular operation, the bottleneck is the manufacturing time. The machine only has so much capacity. So how do we add extra capacity to the machine? Well, we start to make it more efficient by taking off some of the load off the operator where he's not getting production out of the machine by moving that to another part of the world. And that could be done locally if you have the talent, but a lot of times people are having problems problems finding those operators. And so if we can find that operator and we can move it overseas and the thing that most people have a problem with and they don't really understand in this process is they often look and say, well, it's more efficient 
that if I just have my operator. But what they don't understand is because they look at how much that machine costs them to run and they say, oh, well, this machine costs me $20 an hour to run or $50 or it could be $150 or $1,000 per hour to run. And they see that as their only overall cost, not realizing that if this is a bottleneck process, the bottleneck process doesn't have the cost of just that individual machine. It has the cost of the whole entire operation, the whole entire factory. And what that means is because if that's the thing that's keeping more product from flowing out the door, going back to like a car manufacturer, right? They have 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, $80,000 car that is being held up by one individual chip. Maybe that chip is $50. I don't know how much it costs, $100. Would an auto manufacturer be willing to pay you $300 so they could move that along? I believe they would. And they didn't do that because there just wasn't that capacity. And so they would have paid much more to get that moving because they could have been pre increased the throughput through their operation. So in the same way as if you look at a bottleneck operation and whatever that might be for your organization, maybe that's labor to get product out the door, you need to be looking at it in a different way. And so sometimes it's not really about efficiency, it's about throughput through a bottleneck organization or operation. And so you can then basically be trying to find unique and interesting ways to expand that bottleneck. And one of those can be using remote teams. So another example, uh, right now we're working on filling a position for a manufacturing company in the, in the wood industry. And they're having a problem finding people for CAD positions. They have tons of capacity. Their machines are automated and computerized and they can load the parts on and they can pump them out every day and they can do a lot more volume. But the bottleneck for them is getting the plans ready to produce for their machines. And so that's where we're able to help them out by coming in and basically taking their AutoCAD drawings, converting them into SolidWorks, and then from SolidWorks, they're able to move right into the computerized machines. But that bottleneck is finding the competent CAD operators in the US that they're able to then use to create those parts. And so they can increase the throughput and increase the profitability of their company. So that's ways that you can you know, think about using remote teams differently because many people think, oh, this is just knowledge work, but this can actually flow into the manufacturing side as well. But it might just uh, require you getting more creative. And I really encourage you to read the book because they did some very different things in their manufacturing operation. And you say, hey, I'm not in manufacturing. And that's true, but I see manufacturing even in service businesses is very, very similar. Even taking McDonald's, they actually reclassified a couple years ago their operation, I believe, from a food manufacturer and from, from a restaurant into a manufacturing operation. Because if you go back in behind the counter and see how they're operating, they're actually taking some of these principles of lean manufacturing, the theory of constraints, and putting them into practice as they're creating your burger for you. And so they understand that even in a service related business. And so for example, even in my marketing company, where a lot of what we're doing is creating purchase orders and buying products from companies around the world, our job is to manufacture purchase orders. So we are really a manufacturing company. We just manufacture purchase orders, but that takes a lot of steps along the way. You need information. Some of these processes can be running parallel. Some of them need to be running successfully sequentially. And when we understand that and understand how to can exploit those bottlenecks, we're able to increase the throughput through the operations in incredible ways. So two great books that I recommend for you. The End of the World is Just the Beginning by Peter Zeehan and then also The Goal by Eli Golrat. Hopefully this was helpful for you as you think about your operation, increasing your throughput, having a map to the world, and then being able to use your teams to take your company to the next level. To, until next time at Beyond the Office, we wish you a great day. So if you'd like to learn more about remote staffing, feel free to message us for our free guide, The Seven Deadly Sins of Remote Staffing, and how to make sure that you don't commit them and you're successful in your remote hiring journey. That's it for today's episode. Thank you for tuning in and digging deep into what's ahead for the future of remote work. We'll be back next month with Bill for another episode. But until then, please visit Staffing Global's website for additional resources at staffdifferent.com. 
And remember, don't let the shift hit your plans.